you'd like to Very kick cool. us off. Awesome. Well, thank you for being, thank you for, you know, joining Kelly and helping put this together. Uh, my name is Jack and I am the social media, digital marketing and events intern for Hana House, which is a, um, which is part of SAP. Uh, Hana House was inspired by the concept of European coffee houses. So it's a pay by the hour workspace. Um, and part of the goal is to be very collaborative. Um, we try to foster the spirit of collaboration and innovation within Hana House because we believe that great ideas can emerge from everywhere, especially when people come together in a supportive environment. Um, and we work with people like Kelly to put on these events for our community, um, just to learn more about different topics going on in our world. And it's you know super informative and it helps us stay ahead um, in business, in any industry that we're in. So thank you, Kelly. And I'm super excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Jack, and thank you everyone for joining live or following along. Uh, if you happen to be one of the many who watch this on recording, I'm thrilled uh, to be celebrating a several year partnership with Hana House and the SAP uh, innovation team to bring to the community really interesting expert talking points around relevant and timely subjects about how we work and about the future of business. Innovation at its core is something that's central to our team at On Its Access, and I am really excited to be here today to talk with you about ethics and AI, really leaning in to the subject as it relates to shaping a responsible future. So thinking about the role of technology in supporting community initiatives um, and really framing that further in ensuring fairness, transparency, and equality in implementation around AI policies. Though it is important to note that the subject of AI is one that I recognize brings up a lot of confusion, uncertainty, uh, FUD, if we should say, fear even. Um, so fear, uncertainty, and doubt for many people. And so today, a piece of this will also be right setting on what AI is, what it isn't, and right setting on how AI can impact businesses from small Main Street businesses and early stage startups to enterprise Fortune 100 companies. Now, a little bit about me and my connection to this topic as we get started is also really important. And so my name, as Jack said, is Kelly O'Connell, and I am your speaker today. Um, I'm an executive at the team On Its Axis, and On Its Axis is an award-winning innovation firm. We're a firm that since 2009 has been preparing companies for the future. We do this at the intersection of product, people, and process. We help companies with organizational development and change management, research and human-centered design, business and digital transformation. Really what that means is we're helping companies today be leaders in innovation and ESG strategy to help them unlock new areas of opportunity, to help them avoid disruption, and to help them as they help to bring about the future. And so as a team, Honest Access has had a keen interest in the impact of AI on the business ecosystem for some time now. Now I know we're not the only ones who've AI been thinking about it. Let me just back up for just one second and just speak um, and introduce uh, a really important element here, which is what is AI? So we've been paying attention to AI. And uh, about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, an expert in uh, the AI space around meetings, AMI, American Meetings Incorporated. And their team is a global leader in event planning. And we did a joint presentation on AI for the meeting event uh, and in really in-person and virtual events impact. And they created this really neat avatar, Amy. And Amy introduced the subject 
of AI. And so I'll leave it to Amy to do the first introduction to what is AI? Because for us to have a really meaningful conversation about this topic, it's really important for us to be talking about AI from the same page. So Amy, take it away. AI or artificial intelligence uses computing power to perform tasks like reasoning, learning, problem solving, and understanding natural language. AI-driven machines can process large data sets, identify patterns, and make decisions. As AI advances, its integration into daily life grows. Embracing AI offers competitive advantages across fields. In business and technology, embracing AI isn't just advantageous, it's essential. It enhances data processing, pattern recognition, and decision-making vital for thriving in an innovative, competitive world. Thank you. I hope you enjoy our seminar. Thank you, Amy. Our virtual avatar. So I think um, this is our first introduction as a collective group to this idea of AI avatar use. Um, the script can be created using an AI language modeling tool, one you may be familiar with, ChatGPT, another copy.ai, or another Blaze by the team at Almanac, uh, which is now running Blaze, which is an end-to-end -end AI solution. All of these are examples of AI for copy creation. And we're going to talk a little bit about AI, but before we do, let me turn it over to a quick question to all of you which is really about how you're using AI today. Some of you may have children who are using AI to create presentations and images and avatars for their gameplay uh, in their online personas. Um, but how are you using AI? Feel free to use the chat uh, and just share. It could be in your personal life, it could be in your professional life, but I would just love to quickly hear from you about how you're using AI. And there are many ways that that we find that people are using AI um, within their personal lives, from AI for meeting lists or um, in preparation for parties. Uh, people are using AI uh, saying, I have an up upcoming spring uh, event and I want to know what things should be on my checklist to make sure I don't forget um, when to engage a florist, when to engage the caterer, how to estimate a budget, how to estimate the number of glasses of wine or bottle um, my group might want or need. These are all of personal use. We also have some professional examples. People are using AI to build products, to launch companies, um, to disrupt existing marketplaces. Uh, people are using AI to predict buying trends from customers or to do new customer segmentation testing. There are a lot of ways that we're using AI. And there are also a lot of that I've heard from our work with change management within companies that people are afraid of AI. And so today we're gonna have a really honest conversation about that intersection point, about the value that we're starting to see in the marketplace from AI, the very real fear and reluctance to adopt AI in an enterprise environment, and then some best practices, a roadmap around how to use AI within the workplace with guidelines, with which I like to call the bookends, the parameters that keep your organization safe and set a policy. Make no mistake, uh, if you turn a blind eye to the use of AI at a corporation, you are putting your organization at risk because people are using AI within their current workplace roles. And we're seeing that not just people who are on today's call, um, but we're seeing that across organizations. We're seeing that within uh, the individuals that are using AI um, in personal lives. We're seeing it in the language model development, and we're seeing it in the workplaces that we have an opportunity to partner with. So, we're going to talk a little bit about industries where we've observed uh, that AI has had a significant role uh, and is being widely explored 
uh, in very disruptive ways today. Marketing, I mentioned several tools that are being utilized in the marketing space. Healthcare, there is a lot that's been being done around business process automation. Um, today in the healthcare field, that business process automation is beginning to lean into the use of AI. So AI for appointment reminders, for um, invoice codes, for uh, health card and HIPAA compliant chat solutions. Um, there's significant uh, emergence of AI in the healthcare space. Finance, there's significant um, development and new startup uh, work being done in the fintech sector around the use of AI to power fintech, be it um, modeling for saving, be it anticipating trends, be it anticipating wealth transfer, thinking about customer audiences, um, avoiding late fees, um, exploring different ways that you can uh, leverage current financial assets to be able to support existing business. There's a lot being done in the finance sector around the use of AI. Retail, we talked a little bit, um, or I mentioned very briefly at the starting slide about the use of AI um, in predictive modeling. In retail, this is a very um, keen example. So reducing waste in the retail cycle, really looking at order trending, looking at regional variation in product distribution, looking at logistics and how um, delivery at different times, different patterns of day um, delivery, different um, methods of moving product from drop shipping to localized shipping to hyper delivery um, are all being utilized within that retail sector to explore efficiencies. In manufacturing, similar to retailing, we're seeing um, a real focus around supply chain and how AI can help prevent supply chain shortfalls like what we saw in the early COVID quarantine period, really looking at predictability, not only in um, resource allocation, but also in, in access and really looking at triggers and dashboards for how manufacturing is accomplished in the most cost-effective and sustainable ways. Um, so there's some really incredible tools there. And in transportation and logistics, as you might imagine, we're looking at all kinds of um, utilizations from uh, the volume of traffic patterns, city planning, um, travel, um, the cost of tickets, um, really this industry, and then all of the stuff we've already mentioned around retail, manufacturing, supply chain. Um, so AI is being widely adopted to industries that, that are really central to gross domestic product here in the US and around the world um, today. It's also being used by uh, really innovative teams in Main Street business. It's being used by um, realtors and pizza shops and one of my favorite things to talk about on Business Bites for some reason, coffee shops and ice cream uh, stores um, to, to talk about regional variances and flavors, for example, or to test different ads to drive customers or to test different deals and incentives um, to drive customer adoption um, and help set them apart from the competition. So AI can be uh, complex and business model innovating, or it can be a tool to supplement an existing business model um, and really just drive customer traffic and customer flow. And there are lots of tools being designed and developed to really be able to help accomplish that. Now, that said, I think um, it's important to take a quick pause because I did mention at the beginning this idea of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there is, as I talk about these talking points about how AI is transforming, there's probably at least one of you right now who's been listening and saying, I'm overwhelmed or I'm scared or um, maybe even Terminator style worrying that robots will take over the world. And so I'll ask the question, when do you think AI was first created? 
and when and what event marked its official start. So just drop into chat, um, if you will. What year do you think AI was first created? So one of the things I love seeing is uh, the variety of answers, 2000, 1990, the 80s. I even have an answer around since the 60s. Um, and so I think it's really important as we talk about AI as if it's a new concept in media today um, to really bring back um, and help to combat some of the uncertainty and doubt um, to bring back that the the industry, the idea and the term was coined way back in 1956. It was coined at an academic conference at Dartmouth University where uh, artificial intelligence was the culmination of centuries of study and philosophy and mathematics and early, early computing technology, really looking at human efficiency. And the landmark conference at Dartmouth, which is what it was called, took place in 1956. It was a summer research project and it took place in July. And if you're not familiar, Dartmouth is in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's a beautiful little community. And John McCarthy was one of the key figures and he was there with Marvin Minsky and Nathaniel Rochester and Claude Shannon. And they were all talking about how maybe they could bring together these concepts, computing, philosophy, and mathematics, to think about how we could train a model to be able to help improve outcomes and efficiency. And that really was the birthing of a 50-year-plus uh, movement, let's see, 1956, 70 years. Um, I could use AI to help me here right now on the actual number of days. Um, but, but what I'll tell you is that this is a long time coming. This is not a new concept. Um, what's new is that our technology, the speed of our processing, the speed of our computers, the um, size of the chips necessary are fast enough to be able to create meaningful language models that can be trained. The, the framework is established enough that we can create the guide rails necessary for those language models, for the processing speed, to be able to be trained in a way that is material, meaningful, and um, actually aligned to the intent. And this this only this only worked at this convergence point because of that combination, because of the years and years of history, the technology innovation, the access to the power, to the chips, to the solutions to be able to do the processing speed, the human willingness to adapt and adopt to technology, and the structure and, and understanding around how to build the models. And that's the most important thing, in my opinion. And, and hopefully it'll be the piece that for this group creates the most certainty around this idea of embracing and adopting AI is this idea that today artificial intelligence can be limited and can be structured in a way that really upholds human standards of ethics, morality, and fact. And so we have to know what those things are. And certainly, just as anything, there can be misdeeds that can be done if we're not careful about implementation because we are training the models, humans are training the models. But, but AI is a tool. And I would say that the fear related to AI is not that different than the fear that people had when the web, the internet was first being introduced. And there was a tremendous amount of fear as the internet became the World Wide Web. And it went from 
intranets or guardrailed um, sort of internal network systems to a worldwide web that allowed for collaboration and communication um, and allowed for really transformational business use. And so if you're a small business owner or if you're a leader in an enterprise company who has been experiencing some fear around the adoption of AI, I encourage you to think about that analogy. Think about the history of AI. Think about and look for all of the research that's been done in this space. And what I'll share with you is that if you still have fear around this topic, please follow on its axis. We'll share our information at the end. We'll be posting a list of really incredible resources in an upcoming post this coming week that will list um, both historic, uh, really expert theoretical books on AI, as well as current topics and some tools around AI adoption um, that I believe can really help provide some clarity around it and can help make it possible for you to begin to move past that fear, uncertainty, and doubt and start to think about how it can be used as a tool, which is our belief that it should be a tool for helping to implement your business objectives and helping you innovate and stay ahead of the curve in your space. And so that said, we're going to move off of this concept of sort of uncertainty, and we're going to add to that original definition. And we're going to talk a little bit about ethical AI. And so what is ethical AI? Very simply, ethical AI is the practice of designing deploying and managing AI technologies in a manner that respects human dignity and diversity, ensures fairness and accountability, and upholds the highest standards of integrity and collaboration. And in a few minutes, we're going to give just a very simple four pillar framework for how all companies, regardless of your size, can begin to develop a playbook around ethical AI implementation um, that will allow you to build the managed artificial intelligence policies necessary to be able to implement and use AI to your advantage as a workplace. Because just like standing up a website in 1996 to 2001 um, was a really large undertaking for organizations that had the opportunity to transform business opportunity and reach, AI has a similar um, multiplying effect on organizations that understand how to use them to increase operational efficiency and really empower team members to operate in their thrive zones, which is really our focus, is de designing a policy that allows for that. So as we talk about ethical AI, um, the implementation is about striving to create inclusive technologies that enhance well-being while promoting adaptable solutions. So we recognize, and on many prior Business Bites talk, we've talked about the increasing rate of change um, because of things like technological evolution. The world is changing, and so we don't want to build solutions that are fixed. We want to build change agile solutions. And today, AI, particularly language model AIs, can be really incredible at helping to build adaptive solutions for workplace. Um, and it is important to build solutions in a playbook around AI that will, that will allow your team to innovate at the pace of change. And so ethical AI is doing that with sort of some guide rails around thinking about how your company interacts with customers, thinking about responsibility, um, thinking about goals. And I'm gonna share an example around this that I think helps to drive it home. So one utilization of an ethical AI practice um, or an AI practice that's widely adopted is virtual chatbots or AI-driven chatbots. They're language model-driven chatbots that are built with a knowledge base. Organizations are building sort of closed knowledge bases. They're teaching them about their brand voice. They're teaching the, the virtual AI how to engage common FAQs. They're 
they're connecting it with common links. But ethical AI takes that one step further. Ethical AI builds out the recipient customer avatars, and it ensures that the chatbot understands how to create language responses that are inclusive. So, for example, using inclusive gender pronouns or using inclusive um, ability or regional variations based on where the chatbot is being utilized. But it's also thinking about where your customer may be chatting with you from. For example, maybe you've created a chat bot for customer success as an airline, and it's a virtual chat bot, um, and you're engaging with passengers, ticketed passengers. And you've done this to help increase the speed of customer support for common customer passenger inquiries, like changing your seat or changing a ticket when a flight is delayed. Um, but an ethical AI practice around this would say, what if our system doesn't notify that the flight is delayed um, until after the passenger has already onboarded onto the plane? And so it's a loaded plane and the passenger is on the runway and the passenger is looking to rebook the flight. We can't have a response that tells the passenger to exit the plane. We can't have a response that tells the passenger to do something that je may jeopardize that passenger's safety or the safety of other passengers. So it's contextualization um, as a barrier. It's promoting adaptable solutions, and it's thinking about that customer at the center of the experience. And so that's, I think, a really nice example of how a chatbot may incorporate some of the elements of ethical AI um, and how an organization really needs to think holistically as they're building out those knowledge cases, as they're building out the use cases. The other element of this is about centering on transparency, trust, and a commitment to achieving beneficial results for both your organization and the individual. And so this isn't that different than when companies initially started using automated phone um, dialing systems. And so anybody here who's ever been on hold with an enterprise organization um, and found themselves jumping in, operator, operator, agent, um, that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to think about a really incredible customer experience um, that benefits all of the people who may be engaging with your brand as we're designing our AI solutions. We're thinking holistically and we're thinking with a full framework. I'm going to just pause and see if there are any questions in the chat before I move to the next slide. Any, any keen questions coming up here? Okay, great. So as we move ahead, I'm going to share um, back to that AMI organization um, that I mentioned earlier in today's talk that I had the opportunity to give a presentation with. They're a leader in the event planning space. And I think that it's a really wonderful example of an industry um, that's embracing AI um, in an ethical way to create and transform meeting planning in the industry. And AMI, I think, has done just a brilliant job at leveraging and thinking about this. And what you're seeing on the screen are some examples of ways that AI can be utilized to help with that planning process. So really thinking about strategically sourcing, thinking about the production piece from content to um, creating more interactive experience. So if you've attended a conference recently, um, you may have found yourself watching compilation videos on day two from day one events. Um, those elements are made possible because of innovations in event in a a AV production. They're made possible because of um, really the that intersection of tech and adaptability. Another really um, great example 
has to do with space sourcing. And this is a great example um, from AI, AMI because what it's showing is ways that dispersed teams, um, differently abled teams, people with different budgets, um, are able to be able to holistically think about the meeting and event planning in a different way. So these are all tools or solutions that are being used to innovate the space and innovate the space in a way that gets incredibly creative, where you can start to think about um, people who are differently enabled within your workplace. You can start to think about um, seating charts, as you're seeing on the screen. You can start to think about fire safety. You can think about COVID plans. You can think about um, doing all of these things without uh, people with different allergies or food needs or just food preferences. For example, um, if you're a vegan or vegetarian and you've ever had to wait until everyone else was on dessert for your plate to be um, served, you may be interested in some of the AI tools that are coming up around um, event and meeting planning. Um, and that's what's really exciting is that these sources um, are really great ways to show how industries can embrace and change um, and adapt in ways that are cost-effective, inclusive, intentional, um, and just create a better experience for both the company in terms of operational cost and efficiency and the team. The other element of this um, that we're seeing a lot, and you've probably participated in, um, has to do with the utilization of evaluations, which allow for um, orgs like AMI to plan better. So thinking about creating commonality, looking for data observances across an organization, sort of three-year history of event participation to make recommendations on features and programs, looking at alignment with meeting champions or looking at innovation for the industry. Um, all of these things become easier when we're using technology to drive the heavy lift on data and analysis and engagement. Now, I mentioned earlier, and I wanna to speak to this, Ethical AI in your business um, may sound really daunting, but there are some pretty simple implementation patterns. We've created four simple pillars that on its axis that can help to create the foundation for a playbook and policy on AI, whether your company is a five-person business or your company is a global enterprise. These four pillars can scale with you, they're change agile. I'm gonna spend a little time talking about them today. They're easy to apply and easy to adapt and adopt. The first is transparency. What it means is a clear understanding of how and why a systems make decisions. So really setting up within your organization alignment around how your company feels. So from a leadership standpoint, taking a stand and saying, this is our policy on AI, and truly understanding the system and structure. It is not a good idea to pretend team members aren't using AI, whether it's for social posts, whether it's for report reports, whether it's as simple as do we allow for AI meeting summary in our Zoom use for Zoom meetings? Do we allow our chief of staff to use the meeting trans many meeting transcription services to be the foundation for meeting minutes? Or is that at risk with our privacy and security policy? Creating a very simple policy on which AI systems are used, how they're used, and then how those systems make decisions and are adapted within your workplace is a really important piece. This allows you also to share it publicly with users, with internal stakeholders, and it helps to reduce that FUD we talked about. There are a lot of people right now who are using AI, and there are a lot of people who are actively resistant to using AI. And so really creating transparency around your approach to it can help with 
adoption, adaptability, and it can help reduce risk as a team. The second key pillar that we talk about is accountability. This means establishing tools to hold the organization responsible for behavior, setting up a key point person, ensuring that AI acts with the standards and legal requirements, not just of your company policies, but of your industry. Earlier, some of you may have noticed that several of the industries that have widely adopted AI and are using AI are highly regulated industries, healthcare, finance, for example. These are industries that have very strict standards and legal requirements, and those requirements are ever-changing. And so having a policy that is set for your industry is set for your level of security and policy and having a team within your organization that's responsible for managing and maintaining your adherence to the changing standards, both regionally and globally at the umbrella level is really important. Also having an oversight protocol and a clear policy and practice can really help to manage risk related to AI governance or risk related to um, AI pursuit should people decide that they want to challenge your use of AI. And so just having the policy in place, having a standard, showing that you're making a best and good faith effort to follow the standards of your industry can be really powerful. The third key pillar is fairness. And we believe fairness is essential from a customer adoption and employee engagement and an employee satisfaction standpoint. Um, it's important for creating an intentionally inclusive environment, intentionally inclusive customer policies, um, and it helps to manage against the risk related with bias and discrimination. It promotes equity and inclusivity, which has time and time again, been shown to demonstrate a direct connection to innovation capacity in organizations, in innovation capacity, as many of us know, and if you're attending Business Bites, I'm guessing you know, is directly related to market opportunity, market competitiveness, and the ability for sustainable growth. To be able to do this in practice, it's really important to have a diverse team of regular audits um, that are set up and to have, we're training the models. Remember, AI is designed and developed by people and people have unconscious bias today. And so we want to make sure that we're managing against unconscious bias being exponentially increased within our models. And so we want to make sure that we have a practice for a diverse audit of our models to make sure that we're not accidentally leaving out a really important key audience segment. Additionally, I know anybody here who is coming here from a technology hat and many Business Bytes attendees are coming with that technology hat. It also means protecting systems from unauthorized access, from uh, the company, from unauthorized data disclosure, and, and really just ensuring data integrity. It means adopting robust cybersecurity and data protection standards for your organization. Now, these four pillars, as we talked about, um, you know, I said they could be adapted for any organizational level. And so I want to talk to you about being a coffee shop or being a ice cream shop, which I mentioned, and thinking about this, or being an early stage startup and saying, but Kelly, you said robust cybersecurity, and you talked about setting up an audit team, and I have five people. Now, remember, this can be just as many other aspects of your business um, as you're just getting started or as you're a small team or from multiple hat wares. This can be outsourced. This can be a simple just review process as an executive team. It can be something that you have as a really simple standard process that you just adapt a template like on its access's platform um, to protect yourself. There are ways to do this and do this and adopt policy that's, that's simple and scalable and doesn't take up all of your time. And so just because we've used this sort of wording of robust, 
um, doesn't mean time intensive. It doesn't mean resource intensive. It just means having a practice in place for these four areas. It means thinking about how do I make sure that those people who've signed up to be on my multiple cone um, program and my marketing list don't accidentally have their information shared with larger chat GPT? How do we make sure that I'm not accidentally sharing the personal flavor preferences of my team with other market research agencies? And there are some very simple ways to safeguard your firm, um, either adopting a third-party tool or platform, adopting a simple ready-set policy, or just thinking about it within your own team and setting up closed instances of the most widely adapted products. So it's it's really important just to think about those four pillars and then scale them up or down based on your organizational size. Now, I'm gonna wrap up soon and just take questions, but the key thing I wanna talk about here as we're starting to conclude is really about the intersection between AI, productivity, and sustainability. AI does not replace human effort at the organizational level. AI tools should streamline process, they should allow for enhanced productivity, and they should be replacing repetitive tasks, just like business process automation, so your team can focus on the human-centered tasks that they thrive with. What we found in working with organizations is that teams that adopt AI in this manner to enhance productivity have higher, exponentially higher employee engagement and satisfaction ratings because employees see productivity in their workplace. They're spending time on the areas that they're most excited about doing work. They're creating opportunities for upskilling in their workforce that allow for their team members to have future ready skills. And so team members tend to be more satisfied and have lower turnover rates. They're excited and they're spending less time on redundant or repetitive tasks, um, which allows for more creativity and allows for a higher pipeline of innovation sort of opportunity within the workplace. And so we're seeing really exciting um, connections between productivity-based AI tool adoption in organizations and employee satisfaction, as well as company efficiency and output. So we're seeing reduced operating expenses while also seeing increased employee satisfaction. So hopefully, um, as you start to adopt and adapt some of these tools, you'll be excited to see this in your workplace and we'll all start to see um, some of the benefits of AI as consumers. I know for me personally, I love when solutions feel like a custom fit to my needs. And I'm willing to give up a little bit of my sort of preference privacy to be able to have streamlined solutions. For example, I love using Instacart. And when I order through Instacart, I love recommended products as an alternative when my shopper inevitably is missing something. But I would love even more if the retail supplier was able to see and partner with Instacart in a meaningful way to be able to predict when they may need more oat milk and then share that with the oat milk supplier. Because then when I order, I can have the oat milk I really want. And so these are ways that we can enhance productivity across organizations and really for the consumer as well. Um, it's a silly analogy, but I, I do love my oat milk. Um, and then what does it look like in terms of sustainability? Well, this is about optimizing energy use in operations. It's about reducing waste. It's about manufacturing smarter. It's about creating and using that example that we just talked about, about the oat milk, to create more efficient supply chain, to improve logistics, to reduce waste in production, to allow organizations to drive products to high current 
buyer utilization areas and increase marketing er efforts um, and test new marketing efforts in the lower adoption areas. It creates this idea of an ecosystem that's more informed if it's done correctly. It can help with predicting trends. It can help with the conservation of resources. It can help us have a slightly more green world. And I, for one, am really excited about that potential. Now, around the future of work, a topic many of you know is near and dear to my heart. I mentioned briefly that AI is a skill set of the future, um, but it's also redefining job roles. So there are people who have been performing repetitive tasks for a long time, and those people have tremendous institutional experience. They can begin their transition by helping to train and oversee chatbots. They can begin their experiencing by helping to be part of those audit committees. Um, but they also can be adapting their skills to be thinking about new ways of customer engagement, new product development, new feature development and partnering. I've long believed that customer success and product teams should have a much closer role um, in interactivity with each other. And we see organizations that are upskilling team members in this way and trending their organizational design in a way that allows for this change agile adaptation, um, not only to be delivering better products today, to be, but to be more competitively positioned for the future. And so we're very excited about the opportunity for AI to transform not just what is being taught in schools and learning and development programs within workplaces, but also within the very ways that we work together, within the very ways that we think about work and engaging for work um, and the ways that employers uh, engage talent. And so we think we'll continue to see an increasing focus on creativity, problem solving and social interaction across workplace roles. So there will always be a role for people in work and that role should lean into the thrive zone areas that people bring that AI can't. And that is about ethics, understanding, nuance. Um, and those are really, really important. And then finally, innovation. Innovation is really at the center of all of these elements. So if you think about the on its axis axe in our logo, that on its axis piece is that interaction between the policy, the products and programs being delivered and the people who are receiving them and the people who are designing them. And AI has the ability to allow for a larger intersection, a clearer intersection across those pieces. It is allowing for new aspects of development, new aspects of market opportunity. It's allowing early stage startups to disrupt Fortune 10 businesses, um, but really thinking about experimentation, thinking about change agility in the workplace and thinking about the ways that people will interact with the problems that are being solved, not how they have been interacting with how the problems have been being solved. And so really there is a direct interaction between innovation and AI um, and forward thinking companies are already building solutions to stay ahead of that curve. I'm going to open it up at this time as we near the end of our time together to any questions. I actually have a question, Kelly. Yeah, What's great. your current uh, favorite AI tool that you use daily? Mm. Well, we have a platform at On Its Axis, so I'm a bit biased because I love our toolkit um, and we've designed it to really benefit um, the R&D process. And so it allows for rapid experimentation design, uh, rapid image and landing page creation. It allows for um, really that intersection that we're talking about Um if I have to choose a third party tool, um, one of my favorite 
is one that we're using right now, uh, which is the Zoom uh, team summary for Zoom meetings. Uh, it allows for really great very simple, concise note taking. I'm in a lot of meetings in my role um, and being able to really quickly look back uh, and see key points, key action items, key takeaways and next steps uh, for me is really helpful. Um, one other that I'm a particularly big fan of uh, is the AI um, that's pre-built into Canva. And so, Canva has some really incredible solutions um, that they've been designing and developing for a long time. Um, Canva's magic tool set allows for some really interesting brainstorming around image marketing content. Um, I'm a big fan of what they've created. And then... Um, another question that has come up in the chat that I see is, can you think of a marketing campaign that's done a great job at appeasing people's concerns with AI? Um, one company uh, that's sort of an emerging AI company that I think has done a really brilliant job uh, with driving adoption, um, which I think gets at the root of this appeasing people's concerns with AI, uh, is a company called beautiful.ai, and it is a tool for making decks. It's uh, a tool that allows people to create rapid customer PowerPoints. And so I just talked about Canva. Um, they're really an alternate uh, option. Um, and I think what made them really unique is they allowed for data privacy and for corporate customer adoption of their tool. And I think it was a really interesting um, nuance because in their go-to-market, they saw a gap in how other people were leveraging AI. And they saw a gap in how some of the leaders in the space, Canva included, um, were delivering around solutions. And they went really simple. They said, we can do one thing that a lot of people need to have done and a lot of people spend a ton of time doing, and we can do it in a way that allows for a lot of corporate control, really simple uses around brand tools, brand assets, brand marketing. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not an investor in beautiful.ai. I don't have a stake in their company. Um, but I do think that they've done a beautiful job um, at identifying a market gap and exploiting it uh, while also getting wide adoption. I want to just check back in, Jack, um, coming back to you for a second. When you think about um, AI in your day-to-day -day use? Are there any AI solutions you wish you had that you're like, hey, it would be really great if AI could do this for me? Oh, that is definitely a good one. I think one of my favorite, or something that I would love to explore, and there definitely may be a solution to this already that I have yet to stumble upon, is just having something that can go over content, almost like a fresh set of eyes, instead of having to go to a peer or to find someone to review either the marketing campaign that I'm working on, a Instagram video, or any sort of public content, I would love to have something to just give me criticism, give me feedback in order to improve um, those marketing campaigns. I love that. I think um, if we, as business owners, if we as leaders within organizations just ask our team how AI could help them be more efficient in their roles, what what extra support they'd like, a sort of machine learning option to help with, um, I think you'd be surprised at how many very quick opportunities for solutions are needed and would be accepted within your workplace. And so I think that's a really quick way as leaders that we can drive 
um, some early adoption within our teams. And I love your answer. And Jack, I know there are a couple of solutions and I did mention on its axis, we'll share uh, a list of uh, tool resources. Our platform um, is designed for quick testing. It's designed for um, something that we call uh, the experimentation model. Um, which does a bit of what you're talking about. It it quickly builds copy based on a brand voice and then it allows you to test it with small segmented audiences. Um, so we do have some solutions, not to sell our solution, but we, we do have a solution around that. Um, but there are other people who are also um, solving for this. I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, there's a product called Blaze and it's really about end-to-end -end marketing delivery. Um, and... That's one. Another is Hustle Up. Um, this is more on the creative side. So while what you were talking about was testing messaging maybe for an event description or a workshop or what people might want, um, Hustle Up is a platform for uh, people in the entertainment industry. And they just recently launched a solution that lets people greenlight their own projects. And so really um, imagine you could create a new show concept and then you could get studio feedback on your show content um, to figure out how to improve it all in rapid order. Um, these are some pretty exciting things that are coming up in the world of AI, um, and I'm really excited about it. So thank you all for your time, for your participation, um, and keep me informed. If you find tools, if you're building a tool, I saw a couple of you here are launching your own products. Tell me what problem you're solving. Share. Uh, how your solution will help the world. And I'm looking forward to learning from all of you um, because that's what it means to be change agile. So thank you for that. And back to you, Jack. I might have Jack on mute right now. And so I'll just share our next Business Bites is coming up. Um, in October, which may feel like a world away right now, um, but we're really excited to be coming back with our next Business Bites, October 2nd. Um, we're going to be talking about um, really creating sustainable growth within your business. So unlocking potential, creating sustainable business growth, um, expanding capabilities. So really thinking about emerging market opportunities, whether it's serving an adjacent customer base or it's launching a new uh, feature set to solve an adjacent project problem for your current customers. We'll be talking about how your business can grow uh, and scale through business innovation. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelly.